Good morning. Praise the Lord. Saints and friends, welcome to Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, the friendly church on the avenue. Uh, good to be here this morning. And this time, we're going to turn you over to our worship team. Uh, and I know they're going to say stand and sing and worship with them. So let's do that. Amen. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Can we say praise the Lord? It is good to be here. Good to see you here. God is good. And I'm glad to be in the land of the living in the presence of the saints here. So we're going to ask you to stand. We're going to start out with he will remember me. When on the cross of Calvary, the Lord was crucified, the mob stood round about him and mocked until he died. Two thieves were nailed beside him while in this agony. And one of them cried out to him, do Lord remember me. Oh, will the Lord remember me when I am called to go? When I have crossed the children see, will he his love there show? Oh, yes, he heard my feeble cry from bond to set me free. When I reach the pearly gate, he will remember me. Oh, what a shame to kill him. There on that rugged cross, but such a death was needed to rescue all the lost. His blood was made a ransom to set the captives free. I know that I'm included, and he will remember me. Oh, will the Lord remember me when I am called to go? When I have crossed the chilly sea, Will he his love there show? Oh, yes, he heard my feeble cry from bond to set me free. And when the pearly gate, he will remember me. At his defeat, I'm kneeling. My sin I now confess. I bow in deep repentance. My soul will surely bless. My blinded eyes he opened. So that the light I see, and when I read the pearly gate, he will remember me. Oh, will the Lord remember me when I am called to go? When I have crossed death, she'll see. Will he 
his love there show. Oh, yeah. He heard my feeble cry from mom. He set me free. And when I reached the pearly gate, he will remember me. Praise the Lord. Yes, yes. Hold to God unchanging hand. All right, now I'm ready. <laughs> Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. And just a hold to God's unchanging hand. Yes, you ought to hold to his hand. Yes, God's unchanging hand. You ought to hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Be Oh, hopes on things eternal, and just hold on to God's unchanging hand. Yes, trust in Him who will not leave you. Yes. Whatsoever the years may bring, yeah, by your blessed friend forsaken, yeah, still more closely to him cling, yes, you ought to hold. To his hand, yes, God's unchanging hand, you ought to hold to his hand, oh Lord, God's unchanging hand, Be, build your hope on things eternal, and just hold to God's unchanging hand. Mm, covet not this world's vain riches. That so rapidly decay. Oh, yeah. See. To gain the heavenly treasures, you know they will never pass away. Yes, you ought to hold to his hand. Yes, God's unchanging hand. You ought to hold to his hand. Yes, God's unchanging hand. Be no hope on things eternal. And just hold on to God's unchanging hand. Mm, when your journey is completed, Oh, yeah. If to God you have been 
true. Yeah. Fair, fair and right, the home in glory. You know your, your enraptured soul will view. Yes, you ought to hold to his hand. Yeah, God's unchanging hand. You ought to hold to his hand. Yeah, God's unchanging hand. Be feel your hopes on things eternal. And just hold on to God's unchanging hand. Let's do it one more time. Yes, you ought to hold to his hand. Yes, God's unchanging hand. You ought to hold on to his hand. I know God's unchanging hand. Be, build your hopes on things eternal and just hold to God's unchanging Good morning, the breakfast. And good morning to our visitors. Uh, for our visitors, for you that don't know me, my name is Deacon Leonard Rivers. I'd just like to introduce myself and welcome you to uh, the first Sunday of March here at Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, our scripture will be uh, from Romans 3, verses 5 and 6. Amen. When you get there, I mean, you're there already. So let's read uh, Romans 3, verses 5. It reads, But if your unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I'll speak as a man. Certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? That's Romans 3, verses 5 through 6. Let us all prepare our hearts for prayer. <laughs> okay. Father God, we come to you this morning. Father, thanking you for your grace and mercy, Lord. Thank you for the things that you do in our lives, Lord. Thank you for this weather, Lord. Thank you for the rain that you've given us, Lord, to work out our drought in California, Lord. Thank you for the sunshine that we woke up to this morning, Lord. Thank you for the air that you provide for us to breathe, Lord. Thank you for the food that you put on our tables, Lord. Thank you for the jobs that you send us to every day, Lord. And Lord, we just like to thank you for bringing us here today to all worship as saints, Lord. Lord, we just ask your forgiveness for all our sins and all, and uh, Lord, ask you for all our sins, Lord. Lord, we like to pray for the one that's going to bring the word today, our uh, minister, Mark Goodwin, we want to lift him up, Lord. Pray for him and his wife, Lord. Keep them in our prayers, Lord. And Lord, as we uh, we want to pray for our pastor, Pastor Earl C. Stuckey and his wife, Sister Kate Stuckey, Lord. Lord, we like to continue to pray for our church, Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, Lord. Pray for the ones that attend this church. Pray for the ones that attend in person. Pray for the ones that continue to attend in Zoom, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to pray for the families that uh, everyone that's represented here today, Lord. Lord, I ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we all say, amen. Good morning. My name is Karen Greer, and on behalf of Pastor Stuckey and the Missionary Baptist Church family, we would like to 
Welcome all first time visitors and all visitors to our church. Um, if you are a first time visitor, if you wouldn't mind standing, giving your name, letting us know who invited you to the church, um, we would like to greet you and, and meet you. So if you are a first time visitor or a second or third time visitor, if you wouldn't mind standing, let us know your name. Good morning. My name is Sherwin Harris. I work for the Bay Area Rescue Mission and also I attend Mount Calvary Baptist Church under Dr. Clay Barney Jr. in Fairfield, California. Good morning. My name is Christopher Regalado, and this is my second or third time, I believe, here visiting your church. Thank you for having me. Give me a second to get there. Not as young as I used to be. <laughs> Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Charlotte Turner. Uh, my mother, Lisa, um, invited me a few times. It's always good to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that something is said in word or in, in a song that will encourage your heart. And, and, want, and uh, we invite you to come back again and again and hope that you will consider joining our church. Thank you. Get it together. <laughs> okay, so we'll have our announcements now. Uh, so these are the prayer requests for this week. I uh, we want to pray for Sister Sonetta Robinson as she's recovering from surgery, uh, soldier surgery. <laughs> and we also, Vivian Lee, is requesting prayer for her granddaughter, Alana. She was in a car accident last Sunday, so we pray that she's also okay. And to continue to pray for our, our sick, and sh sick and homebound members and those who have lost loved ones. The archival team ministry is excited to present the industrial tribute for 2023. That's the PBC policymakers. The tribute includes current and former members as well as historical policymakers. The presentation is in display in the Northeast hallway over here. The women's ministry is asking all women to return their sign up volunteer form as soon as possible. You may give them to Levon Kilgore or Charzetta McCurry. You can call in, email, or text your response to either Shirley Reynolds, Levon Kilgore, or Rosalind Simpson. Additional forms are available on the table at the exit doors. The Starting this Tuesday, the Tuesday morning Bible study class will have in-person meeting every Tuesday at 11 a.m. And Zoom will still <laughs> and Zoom will still be Zoom will still be available. And starting March the 18th, Saturday, March the 18th, we will have monthly prayer meeting every third Saturday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. here at the church. And that is in person. And that concludes your announcements for this week.
The blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength. From day to day, it will never lose his power. Oh, I'm glad it reaches to the highest mountain. Do you believe? That it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, yes, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It's power. It soothes my doubts and calms my fears. And that same blood, it dries all of my tears. All the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Oh, I'm glad that it reaches to the heart. And it flows, and it flows to, the to the lowest valley. Oh, oh yes, yes. Oh, the oh, blood, the blood that, gives that gives me strength from day, from day.
his power. Oh, I'm glad that it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, yes, hold the blood that gives me strength. From day to day, it will never lose. It will never lose. It will never lose. It will never lose. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to the house of the Lord today. Here at a Progressive Missionary Baptist Church of Berkeley, we preach and we teach the Bible. Amen. And we pledge our allegiance to the Bible. So if you're able Please stand with me as we say our pledge. It will be on the monitors. And I want to ask you also uh, to continue standing after we're done so we can go directly into our text. Amen? Let us say it together. I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God, for the make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and a that I might not sin against God. I will read it to the wise, practice it to be holy, and believe it to be saved. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. Our text today is uh, the scripture that was read. It's in Romans chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Amen. It's on the monitors. And the scripture declares, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? Amen, the word of God, you may be seated, amen. First, I'd like to give honor to God, who is my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I thank him for saving me and for waking me up to see another day. I'd like to give thanks and honor to Pastor Stuckey for allowing me this opportunity. It's a blessing and a privilege to speak the word of God. I'd like to thank my wife, Felicia, for her Amen. prayers and her comfort and love that she's been giving me. I thank the Lord <laughs> for my wife. <laughs> Amen. So the topic that I'm speaking about today is directed to the church, primarily, secondarily to all, everyone else. And the title of this is The Question of Evil. Why does God allow it? Yeah. I'm piggybacking off of the pastor when he preached last Sunday about God and suffering. So it kind of, thank you, Pastor, it kind of piggyback right in on this. But this is the question. This is a question that remains one of the biggest stumbling blocks that keeps people from believing in God, from getting saved. And one of the problems is that when people ask a Christian this question, Christians seem to give them just a, standard run-of-the-mill answers you know adam and eve 
which is partially true, which is partially correct, but Adam and Eve, they sinned, they brought evil and suffering into the world. In other words, it's because of man's free will. God will not rob us of the choice to sin. Or we go to that old standby verse. <laughs> I've used it. I'm sure probably some of you have used it. When we're asked a question that we really don't know the answer to, we really haven't studied. We haven't really been listening when the pastor or the preacher's preaching. You know that old that scripture, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord. Yeah. And we'll kick that scripture all down the road as long as we don't have to answer the question. But the scripture tells us if we want to know something, what the scripture says, ask God. James 1, 5, James 1 and 5 declares, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But the catch is the next verse, but let that man ask in faith. So if you are praying or you're asking God for something, but you really don't have faith in God, the scripture says, don't, don't think you're going to get anything from God. But these questions, we can go to God and ask him these questions. He gives us the answer. See, one of the challenge, this is this question is one of the most challenging questions thrown at Christianity, especially in these modern times. And it's one of the most difficult to explain. Amen. See, the argument goes like this. Someone to say, how can a loving God allow evil and suffering? to continue in the world that he created. Yeah, if the Bible says that God is all loving, all good, most holy, all wise, all powerful, all present, and still evil and suffering exists on a massive scale, then the God of the Bible must not really be God. Or the God of the Bible, um, you know, he can't be believed. Yeah, but I come today to tell you there is an answer. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There is an answer, and it's not some easy, trivial, placated excuse. Okay? But it's an answer that can be understood. And if you have faith, it can be rejoiced in. Amen? See, to legitimately answer the question, we can't just stop at Adam and Eve. That's part of it, baby. We can't just go back and stop at Satan. That's part of it, baby. If we really want the answer, we must go all the way to God. Amen? Because ultimately, everything goes back to the nature of God and his purposes. So I want to encourage you today, put on your theological thinking caps <laughs> with me. Get your Bibles ready. Do you have your Bibles? Yeah, get your Bibles ready. Because we will find the answers about who God is in the Bible. And we find these answers about this is found in the foundational Christian theology. Yeah. Amen? So number one, my point is evil exists. Amen? Someone say amen. Yeah. Evil exists. Wouldn't you agree? It's a very real thing. It may not be something that you can hold in your hand tangibly, but it exists. And if you don't believe that it exists, personally, I think that um, you're not really dealing with a full deck. <laughs> if you don't really think that evil believes that, you know, I think the cheese has slid off the cracker. And you're not dealing in reality. Evil doesn't just exist. 
It exists on a massive scale in a dominating way around the world. Amen? Evil is so massive that there are categories to it. Yeah, that's how massive it is. There is natural evil. Natural evil, it's part of uh, the creation itself in its fallen condition. Creation itself is in a fallen condition, and this is how we get these diseases and disasters and catastrophes, tsunamis, earthquakes, like this big one over here in, uh, in Turkey, almost 50,000 people, if more maybe, in one place, volcanoes erupting, bacteria, viruses. Yes, wouldn't you agree that this planet is a very dangerous place to live? Amen. We have floods and wildfires and yeah. tornadoes and hurricanes. Nature shows up. Yeah, Bill, and it's all due to natural evil. Romans 8.22 declares, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Amen. So there's natural evil. We also have moral evil. Yeah, moral evil is personal. It's the internal spiritual wickedness and transgressions which dominate the human heart. You know, people ask that question, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, I want you to know that from God's perspective, there are no good people. When we say that about someone, we're just saying that they're good compared to us. <laughs> they're good compared to another human. But from God's perspective, there are no good people. Romans 3.12 declares, there is none who does good. No, not one. Yeah. And this human heart of ours is corrupt. Jeremiah 17, 9 declares, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Amen? Humanity is driven by lusts that produce sin. Okay? So, so we have a fallen world inhabited by immoral sinners trying to survive by that are driven by selfishness greed wicked passions hate which all this escalates into war we got wars going on right now and the one in ukraine is not the only one that's the one we tell tell you all about but there's conflicts and, 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 and stuff going on all, all around the world. I just saw on TV last night on CNN, they were talking about over in uh, um, Israel. Looks like the beginning of a civil war. People protesting violently in Israel all around the world. We've heard the saying, war is hell. You've heard that saying? War is hell? Yeah. And, and it's true because it's, war is the manifested evidence of moral evil in the world. That's the manifested evidence that there's moral evil in the world. Amen? So next we have supernatural evil. Yeah. This is the force of demonic beings that are as old as creation itself. People forget about that. They've been around since the beginning of creation. Revelation 12 tells us that one third of the holy angels fell with Satan. And they're the ones who make up this force of demons. They are evil spiritual beings who are corrupt, liars and deceivers. And this world system 
is under the control and influence of their leader, Satan. Amen? 1 John 5, 19 declares, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Yeah. See, this demonic force, they fight against the purposes of God. Primarily by deceiving all of humanity. Predominantly by creating these false religious symptoms. Systems. We're creating them. And particularly religions that try to mimic Christianity. <laughs> yeah, I'm not talking about Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, or, you know, or Jainism or Baha'i, all these other ones. I'm talking about the ones that try to mimic Christianity. Now, I know someone might be upset with me here. What I'm about to say. The biggest one. Catholicism. The biggest one. They have the right God, but they don't worship him correctly. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They have the right God, but they don't worship him. They're idolatrous. They worship Mary. They pray to Mary and to dead saints. And they pray for dead people. They baptize babies. I can keep on going. It's idolatrous under the Christian banner. Also, we have Christian science, which is neither Christian nor scientific. If you read some of the stuff that they believe, even the Jehovah's Witness, they have a Christ, but it's not the Christ of the Bible. Mormonism, they have a Christ, but it's not the Christ of the Bible. And even Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. See, the Bible calls them doctrines of devils. And it leads millions upon millions away from the way and the truth and the life. Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. See, there is a structure and order that Satan has set up in this fallen world. That's why the scripture tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Yeah. Natural evil, moral evil and supernatural evil. Amen? Point number two. God exists. <laughs> Amen? Amen? God exists. The God of the Bible is the true and only living God. The God of the Bible is the one God existing in three individual persons, equal, yet same in substance, nature, and power. Amen. He is the only God. And according to scripture, he's completely and absolutely sovereign. Amen. He's in charge of everything. He controls everything. And he will consummate everything. There is not one molecule in the entire universe that's out of line with his purpose. <laughs> not one. But we see, we here in America, we really have no idea of sovereignty. We really don't understand what it means. 
the concept of a sovereign ruler because we all live in this ideological concept of democracy. Yeah. Here in America, we have a republic state, yeah, yeah. meaning that uh, uh, the supreme power is held by the people, yeah. supposedly by the people. and those that we elect to represent us. But world history teaches us differently. World history teaches us that sovereignty throughout most of human history was held by a monarch, a king, a queen, a prince, a lord. And that's why the Bible uses language like kingdom and thrones and yeah. dominions and lords and princes. Yeah. And Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords. He is the absolute supreme ruler of the universe. Amen? So now let's go to the scripture. I want us to get a clear picture of just who we're dealing with when we're talking about God. First, I got a few of them for you, so get ready. Deuteronomy 32, 39. And it is on the screen. Okay? It declares, God says, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. That's the God we serve. Next scripture, 1 Chronicle 29 and 11. It declares, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Your, yours is the kingdom, O right. Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. That's the God of the Bible. And then we have Psalm 115.3, which is personally my favorite. <laughs> but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. That's the God that we serve. God is sovereign. Amen? Amen? See, the reason people ask why God allows evil, it's due to a lack of faith and an inadequate theological understanding. See, many people and many Christians have this idea that God is like us. God is not like us. Amen? We were created in his image. That means we have his image. And, be, and just because we bear his image, we have honor and we have respect in creation. But just because we bear his image don't mean that we're like him. Have you ever, have you ever met um, identical twins? I have. I have. And so it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of weird a little bit. To me it was. Because they look exactly alike. But they're as different as day and night. One is completely this way and one's completely that way. So just because we bear the image, we're not like him. God is not like us. Yeah. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 declares to us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen? So stop this idea that God is like us, that 
that he gets upset like we do. And, you know, he, you know, he gets jealous like we do. And, you know, he takes out being angry like, like we get angry. God is not like us. Now, don't get me wrong or be mistaken. God is holy. Yeah. Amen. He cannot do evil. Yeah. Amen. He cannot do evil. He is the God who is incapable of doing anything evil. He is holy, holy, holy. And yet, he allows evil to exist. <laughs> wow. How? How? Point number three. Now, this is a tough one. Point number three, God wills evil to exist. Yeah. Now that's hard. But God wills it. He is God and he controls everything. Evil is no disruption in God's purpose. If he is God, he is sovereign, even over evil. Amen. Now, only God could allow and design the existence of evil into the universe without being responsible for it. That's another. Only he could allow it to be part and not be responsible for it. See, God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful and evil exists because he willed it to exist. Because if he didn't will to exist, it wouldn't exist. See, God didn't create evil. So don't get me wrong. God didn't create evil. That would be impossible for God. Amen? For it's impossible for him to do anything evil. The scripture says that he cannot look upon evil. That means he can't look upon it in any kind of a positive way. But he willed that it existed. Yeah. So I can hear the question. Why? <laughs> I can hear the question, why? Why would a perfect, holy, righteous God will evil to exist? And to find these answers. See, I didn't I just I didn't come up with this answer. Okay, I want you to know. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not the first person to talk about this issue. This question has been around for centuries and centuries. And it has been answered. We have to look deep into the foundations of our Protestant Christian theology to find the answers. Has anyone ever heard of the Westminster Confession of Faith? Hmm? Yeah, it was written in 1643. That's like 380 years ago they were talking about this. The Westminster Confession of Faith is considered by many to be the best statement of systematic theology that's ever been framed by the Christian church. And they framed it as an attempt to live up to 2 Timothy 2.15. It was an attempt. And 2 Timothy 2.15 declares, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? So the Westminster Confession of Faith has stood the test of time and remains a prime doctrinal standard for Protestants and evangelicals are everywhere around the world. So we look deep into our faith because these are not new answers and these are not new questions. So I looked into it and I found what it said. It declares, in, now this is not scripture, okay? So don't, you know, it's not scripture. This, it's, it's, it is good, but it is not scripture. But they found and they declared in chapter three in paragraph one, it says, 
God from all eternity, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin. Yeah, and it goes down into chapter five and it says, God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Yeah, and then I read on further and it says, yet so as. The sinfulness thereof proceeded only from the creature and not from God, who being most holy and righteous Neither is nor neither is nor can be the author or approval of sin. All that God decrees and and providentially brings to pass is to the praise of His glory. Therefore, the existence of evil in the end is to the praise of His glory. <laughs> Amen. Now I know that's tight, but it's right. If he is God, he's in control of everything. Nothing takes him by surprise. And he has a purpose for everything that he does. And we can't figure it out because he's God. Amen. See, in our, our text, Paul was so brilliant and the Lord used him. And our text brings it all together for us. Romans 3, 5, and 6. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? Amen. In other world words, even when we sin, our wretchedness, our corrupt fallenness, indirectly bears witness to God's righteousness and puts it on display. How will we ever recognize sin for what it is if we had no standard by which to judge it? Yeah, see, we, we see God's righteousness a full display at the cross. <laughs> yeah, we see that at the cross, the holy undefiled son of God received the punishment that we seek, that we sinners deserve and paid the penalty of death. Why? To satisfy the father's justice. And it's by the same justice that God the Son will judge the world by this justice. And so, in, and so it says in verse 6, it says, for then how will God judge the world? By the cross. The cross of Christ is the standard the world will be judged. At the cross, where I first saw the light. <laughs> And the burdens of my heart rolled away. Right. It was there by faith that I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Even in this evil world that we live in, I'm happy all the day. <laughs> Even if a storm comes, I'm happy all the day. Even that people going out committing these heinous crimes and evil. I'm happy all the day. Yeah. We 
we would never see the majesty of God's righteousness if we didn't see the cross. We'd never see the cross if there was no sin. So for the demonstrating of his righteousness to the praise of his glory, God allowed sin. God allowed evil. He's got a purpose for all that he's doing. See, you understand that the greatest evil, the greatest evil that this world has done, that mankind has done, it was when it, uh, uh, it executed Christ, the Son of God, by the crucifixion on the cross. That's the greatest evil thing that this world has ever done. He's the Son of God, and they hated him. And they spit on him and they called him every single thing. He took our sin upon him. He was pure, but he came because of love. And what did the world do? It crucified him. Yeah. And that was the greatest, most act of evil ever done. Greater than what Hitler did. Greater than what Stalin, greater than any of the other evil. This was the greatest evil that the world committed. And guess what? And in fact, it was planned and ordained by God <laughs> himself to display his righteousness to the praise of his glory by saving us, by saving us because he loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We can't, we can't question why God does what he does. Our God is in heaven and he does whatever he wishes. <laughs> today, and man, today we come, it's first Sunday. And we come to commemorate this. Yeah, we come to commemorate, commemorate what happened at the cross. Yeah. We observe the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, which our Lord Jesus instituted and called the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Amen? Which is observed perpetually until he comes back. Jesus is coming back. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's coming back. He can come back anytime because it sure looks like the world is set for it. <laughs> so you better, be, if you're not ready, you better get ready. Because he can come back at any time. Because things are looking pretty crazy, I tell you. We are commanded to do this in remembrance of the sacrifice that he did for us by his death and also to the sealing of benefits of Christ unto true believers and for our spiritual nourishment and growth in him. Also, it is a bond and pledge of our communion with him and with each other. That's why if you don't know Christ, if you ain't saved, don't take this. Because it's not for you. You're going to mess around and something bad going to happen. I don't know. I'm just paraphrasing the scripture. <laughs> but it's not for everyone. God did this for those that will come. Amen? Because the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 22. And it declares, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He's coming back. So I want to encourage you today that if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus, you need to get right with God. There's not anything that happens that God's not in control of. If you're hearing this message, there's a reason why you're hearing this message. So that you would know who God is, that he's in control of all things. And there's a series of reasons that things happened in your life to bring you to this point. So that you can hear the truth of who God is and what he's done for you. And it's your choice. It's your choice. Do you want to go to hell? Or do you want to go to heaven? It's your choice. God already made the way. He already overcame sin. He already overcame evil. That we don't have to be uh, terrified in this world. We have a comforter. <laughs> We have a comfort of the Holy Ghost. And if you're hearing this message, and if your heart's being pricked, this is the time to make the choice because tomorrow might be too late. You can be up and healthy one day, gone the next day. This is your choice. This is your chance. Don't push this aside. This is a, a, an appointed time. And if you hear the Lord speaking to you, make that choice. This is an invitation. This is the invitation time. Come on, choir. pray that uh, you were edified today, and I pray that, that you heard from the Lord. Now, if you're hearing this message, or if you're here and you've made that decision, that you want to be right with God, that you want to accept his love, that you want forgiveness, please contact us. Please come and let us know and talk to me or the pastor or any of the brothers or sisters that are members here. We would love to help you in your Christian walk. 
And also call us if you're online. The information is going across the screen. Contact us. Let us know. God loves you. I love you. Thank you. Amen. Now it's over to the pastor. It's your pastor. <clears throat> And this time it's time for communion. Amen? Amen. Just hold your hand up if you haven't been given. Okay. <clears throat> Good, uh, I think it's afternoon now, church. Right over, right over the deadline. And the chief is here. Um, I'm going to read the, uh, the scriptures uh, for us. Chapter uh, 11, beginning at verse 23. And it reads, for I received of the Lord what I have also uh, passed on to you, that on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is which is uh, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after, after supper and said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. So let whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself and let him eat, of that bread, eat the bread and drink of the cup. Whoever eats and drinks unworthily um, eats and drinks judgment on himself. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. I'm uh, reading again from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. Um, please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you um, for this uh, holy sacrament of communion, Father. We come first committing, uh, uh, admitting all sin and asking for forgiveness, Lord. We know without um, bearing our hearts to you and, and confessing our sins and asking for forgiveness, we cannot truly commune with you, Lord. Uh, we ask you to bless the uh, the communion, Father. Uh, we, we understand it, rep it represents your body and your blood. And we, uh, we pray that you uh, bless it and uh, allow it to be added to us in a way that truly lets us understand the sacrifice that you gave us in, in Christ Jesus, Lord. We ask you um, to bless us, Father, and to bless um, us in our, our going and our coming, Father. We say this prayer in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I I don't really know if you count this a real privilege and a joyful time to obey Christ's command. 
The Bible says that he first gave the bread to his disciples. And he said, take this and eat it for this is my body, which is given for you. And he said, this do in remembrance of me. So now let us all eat together. And then after he gave them the bread to eat, he gave them the fruit of the vine and said, take this and drink all of it. For this is my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. And I say to you, I will not drink any more from the fruit of this vine until that day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So let us all now drink together. Amen. Okay, let us all stand. Are you through picking up the containers? Not yet. Well, stand anyway. <laughs> Amen. Anybody picking up in the balcony? If you have a container in the balcony, just either one of you up there can pick up the containers. Because you know, these brothers are not as young as they used to be. <laughs> Okay, have they all been picked up now? Okay, they're coming. All right. Okay. The Bible says that when they had Are they all picked up? Okay. The Bible says that when they finished with the supper, uh, they sung a hymn. And then, then they went out into the Mount of, of Olives. He had progressive Baptist. We closed with the song entitled, Next Time We Meet. Now, now we're talking about the next time we meet at the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right, next time we meet. <laughs> There'll be, There'll be no more next time we share. Next time we share the bread of the wine. Maybe oh. oh, maybe next year we will be one next time.
Some will have died. Some will have died. Most will have cried. Most will have cried. All will have felt. All will have felt. The touch of pain. Touch of pain. Wherever we go. Wherever we go. There's one thing. There's one thing we know. Love. Love conquers everything. Next time we meet. Next time we meet, there'll be no more tears. Next time we share the bread and the wine. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, or maybe next year, or maybe next year, we will be one. We'll be one next time. Broken the bread. Broken the bread, bury the dead, yet somehow life will always win. Empty the cup, empty the cup, drink it all up, drink it all up. We'll be together, we'll be together again. again next time we meet. Next time we meet, there'll be no more tears. Next time we share the bread and the wine.